Hi, good to have you back. At this point, your legs are probably a touch sore from all the random walking we've been doing. So let's take a break to roll some dice. I'm going to keep rolling a standard six-sided dice, tracking the sum of my dice rolls as I go. And I'm going to stop rolling as soon as the sum is at least six. How many times do I expect to roll this dice? Probably not many times. What do you think? Maybe like two or three rolls? Let's do our usual thing of seeing what we can get without trying too hard. For our first roll, there is a 1 in 6 chance that we get a 6, so it's pretty unlikely we hit the stopping threshold of 6 on roll 1. However, with two rolls, the sample space of the sum is this familiar from high school grid. We can see that it is more likely than not that we have terminated by the second roll. Actually, there's less than a 1 in 3 chance we make it past two rolls. What is the chance we make it past roll 3? very small. To keep going beyond three rolls, the first three rolls are required to sum to at most five. This forces all of the dice rolls to be quite small in value. In fact, none of them are allowed to be four or greater, and that knocks off half the outcomes for each dice. We can use this to quickly nab an upper bound for the probability here. Each dice has a one half chance of rolling a number less than four, so there is a 1 on 8 chance that we roll 3 dice and they all show something less than 4. We can already see that the bulk of this roll distribution is close to 2 rolls. And so that's probably going to be around where the expected value is. And will the actual answer be slightly above or slightly below 2? See if you can reason your way to a decision on this. It's time for us to prove it. The solution is kind of neat, and I'm going to keep things fairly general so that you can extend the solution later on. To do things right, we will let x denote the thing of interest. That is, x is the number of times the dice has to be rolled so that the sum of the rolls is at least six. The formula for the expected value of x looks like this. We take each outcome k, that's the number of rolls it takes for the sum to be 6 or greater, and we multiply by its associated probability, and then we take the sum of all of these. Now, in our case, we know that it will take at least one roll, and at most, six rolls, so we can attach a range of 1 through 6 to our sum. Let me show you a little trick that comes in handy with such calculations. It's easier to see if we first write the sum in full and then stack it all up like a triangle. Now, what are the sums of each of these columns? Each column sum is in itself a sum of probabilities and therefore a probability. For example, the first column is the probability that x is greater than 0. The second column is the probability that x is greater than 1 and so on. Therefore, we have established that the expected value of x is equal to the sum of these cumulative probabilities as k goes from 0 to 5. Why did we do this? Well, it turns out in this case that these cumulative probabilities are easier to calculate. Let's take a look with an example. Say we want to calculate the probability that x is greater than 3 then we just need to count all of the ways we can roll three dice and still not have gotten to six yet. For then we know that x is greater than three. Basically, I need to count solutions to this inequality, where dice one, dice two, and dice three are the values of the three dice I've rolled. Of course, I will eventually need to divide out by all of the possible dice rolls to transfer over to probability land. To reduce further, we can just count the solutions to each of the following equations. Now, we could brute force this, but I want to do this in such a way that you can see how you might structure the general solution. First, three dice must sum to at least three, so we only care about the bottom three equations. And now, we have a more general mathematical thing to work out. Given some positive integer m, 
how many ways can I express it as the sum of three positive integers? The so-called stars and bars method works a treat. I'll illustrate it with the bottom equation. How many ways are there to write five as the sum of three positive integers? Well, simply take five stars. We want to split this up into three smaller pieces. And we can do this by inserting two bars into the four possible spaces between the stars. For example, something like this illustrates that one plus two plus two is a way of summing to five. Therefore, to count all possible ways that three dice can sum to five, we just count all possible ways we can insert two bars into the above row of stars. Well, there are four spaces, so the answer is four choose two. Now, in general, this approach lifts, and the number of solutions to each equation can be found. Reminder, our current goal is to find the probability that x is greater than 3. As such, we basically need to add up the above solution counts and divide by how many possible ways there are to roll 3 dice. It won't come to you as news that there are 6 to the power of 3 possible outcomes from 3 dice rolls. So, we can see that the probability that x is greater than 3 is equal to 1 over 6 cubed multiplied by 2 choose 2 plus 3 choose 2 plus 4 choose 2. Summing binomial coefficients, it feels like we're back in video 1. We are not. These are a little bit different, and we can actually use something called the Christmas stocking theorem to smush this sum into a single coefficient. The Christmas stocking theorem tells you that whenever you take a diagonal sum of numbers in Pascal's triangle, starting from a top edge of the triangle, you can find the answer to the sum by completing the Christmas stocking. It's also sometimes called the hockey stick theorem. Thus, for our sum, we can simply rewrite it as 5 choose 3. I'll leave the details to you, but you can generalise this method to find the other probabilities for our dice. In a similar way, you can show that the probability that x is greater than k is equal to 1 over 6 to the k times 5 choose k for k ranging from 0 to 5. We've done the analysis on the probability and we now apply the direct substitution. Oh, is there anything we can do with this? Indeed there is, and I'll give you a two-word hint. Binomial theorem. We can recognise that our expression is what you get if you expand 1 plus 1 sixth all to the power of 5. Ah, thus we have the answer, and this comes out around 2.16 or something like that, which is pretty close to where our intuitive estimate placed us. OK, if you followed all of that, well done. And if your curiosity has flared up looking at this expression, then well done again, because it looks very close to the form 1 plus 1 on n, all to the power of n, which many of you know tends to e, the exponential number, as n tends to infinity. OK, ours has a slightly different form, but you can prove in a couple of lines that this still tends to e. And actually, you can use what we've learned today to show that the expected number of times an n-sided dice must be rolled so that the sum of the rolls is at least n is equal to 1 plus 1 on n all to the power of n minus 1. Finally, here's something a bit more challenging for you to work on and send in. You and your friend take turns rolling a six-sided dice and you keep a joint running total. The player who first gets the sum to six or greater gets paid out the sum. My question is, do you want to go first or second? When you get the answer, make sure you prove it. As usual, send it in for me to look at. Until next time, enjoy the maths. <laughs>